We have time for a couple of questions from the audience. And if you notice, there's a microphone in the center aisle. So if you have a question, we're going to um, kind of put you on the spot by asking you to come to the microphone uh, with your question. We'll just do this for a few minutes and then we'll take um, time for a quick break. And, um, and keep in mind that we have a, a webcast audience with us today, and so we want to allow them to hear uh, the questions as well. And so that's why we're asking you to come to the microphone, if you would. Uh, good afternoon. Um, I would like to say to Makaro that you mentioned uh, Helen Hunt Jackson. And uh, she had formed an, it, the Boston Indian Citizenship Committee, which in 1879 managed to get a bill through the Senate to indemnify the Ponca. Um, that's our connection. She was a wonderful lady. She was an advocate for Native Americans. Uh, to Mr. Ryden, the Treaty of 1857 you mentioned with Pawnee, with the government, it had an effect on the uh, Treaty of 1858 with my great-great-grandfather, Wash Komodi, a chief of the Pongas. And that effect was that you, well, your grandfathers had sold 11 million acres for seven cents an acre. And the Ponca had wanted 11 cents for 7 million acres. And they reflected. So the, the issues between the tribes are evident there in that particular situation. I don't know whether you're aware of that or not. The Ponca signed a treaty in 1858 ceding the lands. Um, and the question was, why did they want 11 cents an acre when the Pawnee had sold their land for 7 cents? So that was an issue that was between tribes. Um, to Professor Robinson, um, I know that the uh, doctrine of discovery has presently being questioned, and that maybe the, the Pope has intentions of rescinding it. Um, that hopefully will happen. I, um, that hopefully will happen. And where will the doctrine with that you're speaking about, that the, the uh, Supreme Court Justice had put in place, where will it stand then? Thank you. So um, you can decide if you want to respond. I think it was, some, was the first one a comment more for Chairman? And then James, do you want to talk about, respond to the yeah, treaty? Um, the, the acoustics in here are kind of bad, so they, I, really, I couldn't really capture all the question. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, well, there was no uh, acreage, uh, cent per acreage uh, in that treaty. It was just for the Pawnees, the treaty was for, uh, for annuity uh, goods, trade goods, and cash. Um, I think it was the uh, Indian Claims Commission that set the value of the land about seven, eight cents an acre, whatever it was. So yeah, there wasn't a, a percent uh, uh, part of the, uh, of the Pawnee Treaty or none of the treaties that I'm aware of. Do you want to address the doctrine, yeah, discovery real, doctrine? Yeah, real quickly. Yeah, so the, there's lots of movement uh, with the with the Vatican. Although the Vatican doesn't really have anything to do with the discovery doctrine, because that's the South American, and the English didn't really care what the Pope said by the time they settled here. <laughs> um, but some churches, the Episcopal Church, has repudiated the discovery doctrine, and that's sort of getting at all the Christian imperialism stuff. If a court were to repudiate it, it would sort of depend on what they replaced it with. I mean, I don't think it would be, frankly, that... Well, I guess, I don't know, it's a, we can, we'll have a beer later and talk about it. But I think that if, if um, what we're talking about is simply re repudiating any claim to ownership of underlying title, 
in, in the U.S., what that would do would be to convert um, all the tribes essentially into, I guess, the status that the Pueblos and the five tribes in eastern Oklahoma currently enjoy because they, they have re restrictions on, land, on sales of land, but they own the title to their land. So it might not be that earth-shaking. It would be much bigger in other parts of the world where the, the scope of the tribal right under the, uh, under the occupancy portion of the decision is much more limited than it is here. For instance, here tribes as part of their occupancy right own their subsurface natural resources. That's not true anywhere else in the world, right, except in Canada to a certain extent. But so that would be if, if Australia were to uh, reject the discovery rule, that would have enormous uh, consequence. Um, so this is part of what we're all talking about globally now. Thank you. You have a question? Um, so this panel is kind of on bad acts and bad paper. And it seems like uh, one of the most enduring legacies of sort of the bad um, relationship between U.S. government and Native American um, reservations has been enduring poverty on these reservations. And since the 70s, you've kind of seen reservations taking back some of their self-governance capacity. And I'm, I guess I'm just wondering, and, and consequently have seen widely different levels of development across the different reservations. So what I'm curious about is what are kind of the institutional factors that have caused some reservations to develop more relative to others and what can reservations who haven't seen development do to kind of foster that development either by pursuing um, policy reform at the federal level or by um, pursuing internal reforms. Anybody who wants to take it. No, I'm not <laughs> part of that. Yeah. Great. Uh, I need James back on. I, I think the question goes to uh, the disparity of, of economic development and economic activities throughout the uh, United States, certainly with regard, in my head, I hear that, is in regards to um, Indian gaming. And, uh, you know, the two reasons there that, that help explain the current environment for that are uh, demographics. Where are the people in the United States, uh, the population centers, and then infrastructure? Uh, you know, the, how do people get there? You know, um, in, my, in my remarks that I made earlier, uh, there was a, a part where I described where we're located. We're an hour north of San Diego. We're 100 miles or an hour and a half without traffic anyway, outside of downtown Los Angeles. If you've ever been there, it's one continuous mass of cities from Los Angeles to where we are. Um, it's a megalopolis. Uh, California has 38 million and, and, and rising uh, residents, uh, and two-thirds of that population live in Southern California, where we are. And so um, that, that's huge. You know, con contrast that with areas, you know, quickly gets rural when you go east into the desert, into Phoenix, certainly into New Mexico. Um, or north in, in Northern California. There are parts of Northern California that look like the plains. Um, small towns, straight highways, and very few people, and, and oftentimes more livestock than people. So, you know, it's, it's hard to make a casino work with, the, with not a lot of people around. So um, that's, that's the short answer to part of that question, I believe. Yeah, it just, it's a hu huge question, hugely important, hugely interesting, and there are lots of folks dedicating their lives to figuring out, um, you know, what works for tribal economic development. Um, there's a project at Harvard that was referenced earlier that spent a long time thinking about it, and every tribal government thinks about it, but the, the situation is so different. Um, you know, Pachangas, you guys have great real estate, others don't, um, so it's sort of in terms of location. Um, uh, so gaming isn't an option for some tribes, um, and uh, some tribes have natural resources, others don't, uh, governments uh, differ. Um, so, so there isn't an easy answer, I guess, is the, um, 
is the question, but there are some national things that can help, including reforms of tax policy to make tribal economic development easier, raising funds through tax exempt bonds and this sort of thing. Um, and there is a literature on that. If you're interested, I'd be happy to visit with you afterwards and point you in some directions. I, I would just like to add that the, the reason that we even have a reservation land base, I believe, in Southern California for where it is, is at the time of you know the eviction and then uh, the executive order that created our reservation, it was considered worthless land. It was the land nobody wanted. The, the title of my presentation, Pushed Into the Rocks, was really indicative of the experience throughout Southern California, uh, certainly, and I, I won't I attempt to broaden that throughout the, the rest of the, the state anyway, but in Southern California, it was the rocky hill and dry lands that had no springs and, and, and very little artesian water. And uh, that, that's why we ended up with it. So it was worthless then, but you're right about the real estate values of that land, worthless then, but now uh, increasing in value 150 years later. Yeah, that's what, and that's, that's what I meant to say. Yeah. We Oklahoma, have time for, oh, go ahead, James. Yeah, uh, yeah in Oklahoma, too, the, uh, the reservations were pretty much broken up against the will of the people. And uh, so we don't have that uh, large land base. It's just uh, most of the land is held in trust by individual allottees are uh, the heirs of the Lattes, but also uh, culture comes into play, like uh, the Hopis haven't developed uh, gaming, and they do it for cultural reasons, and Navajo's rejected for many years for cultural reasons also, so you can never discount culture when you talk about economic development. We'll take time for just one last question, maybe with one answer from the panelists, because we need a break. Good afternoon, Chairman Macaro. how are you? Haven't seen you in a long time. I'm Jay Winter Night Wolf, WPFW Radio. And my friend, uh, brother riding in, and Robertson, and my sister, Danette Dale. I've been looking at a lot of the treaties over the last five years, and I found quite a few inequities on the part of the federal government to live up to treaties. And I guess all of us are aware that, you know, there's a lot of inequities in living up to treaties. But one in particular that has touched my heart is this treaty that my friend here, Earl. Uh, Burley was talking about the one made by the U.S. government with his great-great-grandfather. Now, I believe you mentioned that the lands in Oklahoma are actually in ownership of the tribes and that there were certain restrictions. But I have a question that I would like to ask all of you, and I would like to give this package to you, too, is if individual families own these lands and have deeds to these lands and over the years there's been oil companies drilling on these lands and they've never received one penny of a revenue from all of this drilling then what's the next step to that to uh, get this rectified if they're on their land mm -hmm. and they just took the land without considering the family's ownership what is what is it that can be done what do you recommend and we have time for just a quick response to that. I know it's a huge question, but go ahead. Get a lawyer. <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> Yay. <laughs> and I, and I, I and graduate I about 80 of them a year who do Indian law. So. All right. Well, yeah, thanks so much, uh, audience, panelists. Learn from all of you. I also have a new lecture from my students on Johnson v. McIntosh. <laughs>